visitors and welcome to anybody who may be joining us online either live or after the fact 
Uh, we're hopeful we've got the folk from Benahee View this morning, uh, but in any case, we, um, we are delighted to be here. Oh, brilliant. Delighted to be here either in, in, our, uh, in our space here or wherever we may be watching or listening. We're beginning at the first Sunday of Lent this week, and we're starting that sort of journey together towards Easter. And we're going to be following a sort of theme of a season of promise over the course of the, the six weeks of Lent. So we're going to be looking at different promises as we, as we travel through Lent together. Promises of God and promises that we make in return. So let us lift up our souls to God. Let us put our trust in him. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. Come, let us worship the Lord. Let's begin by singing together a well-known old hymn, How Great Thou Art. <laughs>
together now in prayer and as usual we'll say the Lord's Prayer at the end of this prayer. The words we use are usually for the Lord's Prayer will appear on the screen uh, but please feel comfortable using whichever words you're most familiar with. Let us pray. Great and glorious Lord, our souls sing when we think of the beauty of the earth that you have given us, even in the midst of the cold. A beauty which speaks to us through well-loved and familiar rhythms, as well as unexpected wonders and mysteries. In the hope of the morning, the confidence of the day, the peace of the evening, or the stillness of the night, you are there. You are present too in storm and wind and wave, not just in power and might, but in the still small voice which whispers to us words of promise, a promise that we are loved, a promise that we are safe with you, a promise that we belong to you, a promise that you are with us. Faithful God, as we begin once again this yearly journey to the cross, forgive us for how easily we fall away, how we lose the desire to seek you, how we pay lip service to following you, while treating those we meet as if they are mere extras in the drama of our lives. Fill us with the grace of your spirit, that we might find afresh the humility to accept the truth that you love each one of us, and that we are called to love and look out for each other. Hear us now as we pray together. Our Heavenly Father, may your holy name be honoured. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today what we really need. Forgive us the wrong we do, as we forgive those who wrong us. Lead us away from temptation. Keep us safe from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever. Amen. As I said, today is the first Sunday of, of Lent, as most of you will know, and it's a time for preparation of, for Easter. And traditionally, it's often a time when people will choose to, to fast or to do without something as a way of preparing. But it's not the only way we do things. We can also choose to do something, to take on something instead of fasting, to do something positive as a kind of a, a spiritual discipline that gets us focusing on God. So our first reading today, which is uh, from Genesis, is the story of Noah, and it's the bit after the flood where God gives his promise, his promise of faithfulness. So, you know, part of our response to that promise of faithfulness is looking for ways to look after each other. So I thought we could have a little brainstorm about ways that we could look after each other. And I'm looking for some help from some of the younger ones. I don't know, Amy and, and Emma, if you could maybe give me a hand. We need a, we need a writer and we need a sticker on. So, so Emma, are you happy to be a writer? Here we go. You can choose your color. We've got some little fish for you to write on, right? So you can, and when people are calling things out, we'll get a writer. And we may need a runner as well, we'll see. We've got blue tacks, so we can stick these up here. And so now we need to get the brains going. So this, in the midst of the winter, and in the midst of the cold, and so many people not feeling that great at the moment, and, and, and not feeling too well, what are some of the ways that you could take on the idea of looking after? Who's got a suggestion? Oh, we're quiet this morning. Fran, yeah. Cups of tea. Brilliant. You keep, you keep armed, Amy, with the, with the sticking. Cups of tea. Keep them coming, I'm sure. Emma can uh, um, write fast enough. Cups of tea. What was that? Help with the shopping. Margaret, help with the shopping. We may. I'll get another pen in case we need another, another writer. If, uh, another writer. If we got. So help with the shopping. We've got Biff. You can be another writer for us. Brilliant. Yeah. Are you doing help with the shopping? Next one. Margaret, you had one. Send a nice wee letter. Okay, one of you got right to that? Yeah. Fill a hot water bottle, okay? Why don't you do that one? Brilliant. You really do need somebody to fill your hot water bottle sometime. That, that's a good way of looking after each other. Anything else? Make soup. Make soup. 
Brilliant, absolutely. Soup, fantastic. Oh, Amy's nice and orderly. Look how neat those fish are. What else have we got? Go for a coffee, absolutely, yeah, So, because sometimes some of these things are based on helping people who are in there at home, but sometimes you need to get out, don't you, when you're just, when you're just feeling like you need somebody, okay, go for a coffee, make a cup, or fill a hot water bottle, make soup, what else do we got? Give them a hug. Give them a hug, that's right, or as Margaret said to us the other week, give them a bosie. So, so we, can, we can write it in the English or the Doric, as suits you. Um, which reminds me, by the way, while we're talking, folks, I, I, I got an email the other day about a, a planned production of The Messiah in Doric, a sing-along um, which is being done in Aberdeen. So if anyone wants more information, you can uh, ask me. Anyway, uh, yeah, anything else? Take them for a drive, absolutely. Get a, a chance to see around the countryside a little bit, lovely. Do their housework. Yes, I appreciate that kind of uh, that kind of help. Yep, absolutely. Do their housework. That can really show somebody that you that you care for them and you're looking after them. Clear the snow. Clear the snow. We needed a lot of that. This this and and, and the ice particularly this uh, um, this summer. Yeah, you had a few close encounters with the snow and the ice, Bob. This uh, uh, this winter, haven't you? As have many of us. Absolutely. So clear the snow. Okay. Make them laugh. That's lovely, Janet. Yeah, absolutely. Because that is a way of looking after somebody, isn't it? Yeah, Joy. Send some flowers. Fantastic. Spend some time with them. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to be a little bit provocative here and point out that I think Richard is the only man who's given a suggestion so far. Oh, no, Bob, too. But we're definitely waiting on the, on the women making suggestions. So, so maybe some other man who's got a suggestion of how you could look after somebody in a way that maybe doesn't involve making soup. Or maybe it does. It would be brilliant soup makers. I'm putting the challenge out there. Any, any, a little bit more masculine input there. Cross the street, as in cross the street to speak to them and everything. Yeah, Barry, that's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, cross the street. Just that sense of being with somebody is great. Yeah, Jim. Be patient. Be patient. Absolutely. That's a great one as well. Because sometimes, sometimes it's looking after somebody isn't just what we do. It's what we don't do. You know, don't nip their head off when they're exasperating you for the 15th time in a row. Yep. That's a, that's a way of looking after folk as well. That's good. Our ocean or our river is looking pretty full of, of helpful fish there. Anybody else? And, and you can be male or female in this case. Yeah. What about actually you two? Have you got one? Because we a, a younger opinion. Anything that hasn't been said. What do you do for one of your friends if, if they were just feeling like they needed a bit of support? Make them happy. That's a nice one, Amy. Yeah, absolutely. And there can be lots of ways you can make someone happy. You might, you might send them a wee message. You might invite them over or out to do something. Lots of things like that. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much. We have our ocean full of fish today. Thank you. Now the reason there's more than a, a connection with looking after people um, or the connection that I want to make here with looking after people and with Lent is an idea I ran across. It's an old idea that comes from the Mennonite tradition and they call it the Lenten Love Project. And the idea of the Lenten Love Project is that each week in Lent, you take on a specific action or idea of an action that you're going to do that week as a way of, of preparing in love for, um, for Lent. And each one has a different, kind of focuses on a different word. So there's the hand of love, which is the first one. And next week, it's going to be the voice of love. So interestingly enough, it already came there from Margaret, is what they suggest in the Lenten Love Project is that the first week in the week of the hand of love, that you take the opportunity this week to write a handwritten letter or card or message to somebody. And they emphasize the handwritten. And I mean, the girls were, um, were writing up and, and putting things up for us because it takes that little bit more time to write something by hand. And in 
gives you something physical to hold on to in a way that, that an email doesn't or a, or a, a text or, or a Snapchat or this kind of thing. So the challenge, and this is not just for the young people, this is the challenge I think for all of us this week, is in response to God's promise of faithfulness and our response that we will be faithful and will look after each other. Let's all try to send somebody, give somebody, a little handwritten message, any kind. And if, like poor Laura, your hand, uh, the writing hand is in a wrist, in a cast, then we might allow you, but it might be interesting to see a creative wrong hand message. But, and you don't have to, you can share it next week, but you don't have to. But that's just a, a challenge for us this week to take that up. And, um, and I'd be delighted to hear of any stories, and I, I'll do it myself, that uh, at some point this week, in the week, send somebody, write somebody, give somebody a wee handwritten message to tell them that you appreciate them. It doesn't have to be, I love you, or anything soppy, just something to tell somebody that you appreciate them. So the hand of love, and we are all held in God's hands. So before you guys go out to junior church, we are going to sing He's got the whole world in his hand. First reading this morning is from the first book of the Bible, uh, Genesis, in the Old Testament. We're in chapter 9 and we're reading from verse 8 to 17. That's on page 10 if you're following it in the Pew Bibles. <clears throat> God said to Noah and his sons, I'm now making a covenant with you and with your descendants and with all living beings, all birds and all animals, and everything that came out of the boat with you. With these words, I make my covenant with you. I promise that never again will all living beings be destroyed by a flood. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. As a sign of this everlasting covenant, which I'm making with you and with all living beings, I am putting my bow in the clouds. It will be a sign of my covenant with the world. Whenever I cover the sky with clouds and the rainbow appears, I will remember my promise to you and to all the animals that a flood will never again destroy all living beings. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between me and all living beings on earth. 
That is the sign of the promise which I am making to all living beings. Amen. Thank you, Linda. Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your eyes. There's a reason beyond the fact that the passage today is from Noah that I've been thinking about fish this week. One of the things that's fun about my job, and believe me, it is quite often fun, my job, is you never quite know what each week or even each day will bring. So for example, when I moved into the manse and began to imagine what my future ministry in, in Veruri here would involve, I didn't picture myself exactly a year later pouring a quake of whiskey into the River Don and saying a prayer of blessing alongside the local anglers. Apparently, my role was a double first. Certainly, they've been doing the blessing as a tradition for some period of time, but it's the first time they've had a women minister to do the blessing, at the dawn at least, in Inverurie. And it's also the first blessing since the local anglers began the process of taking over managing the fishing rights themselves from the council. In terms of the matter of being the first woman, I was told by several of the fishermen that uh, fishing records, some of the best fishing records of all time are held by women, two in particular, uh, which have been held for decades and haven't been beaten. So I think they decided that my gender was a bonus to the proceedings. I'm just hoping I'm not held responsible if, uh, if the fishing isn't so good this year. In addition to it being a novelty for me to do, and also the pleasure of being part of this time-honoured tradition, I was genuinely delighted that the local angling association still wanted a blessing. They could have chosen at this moment of change to dispense with it entirely, or they could have asked someone to do a general, non-specific, let's honour the natural world kind of blessing, but instead, they chose to continue with a Kirk blessing and to seek me out and ask me to do it. Regardless of the variation in their individual beliefs, they were willing, even keen, to invoke the presence and the blessing of God as they began their fishing season. In my experience, it's often the case that people who live or work on or in or by the water have a strong sense of the fact that life is unpredictable and therefore protecting yourself spiritually as well as physically is a wise choice. The danger of water is well known to people in this town. As I was chatting to the anglers yesterday, they pointed out to me how high the waters rose in the floods of January 2016 when the River Dawn burst its banks. Rivers are unpredictable and can sometimes be dangerous, even if on a day like yesterday, in the lovely sunshine, it seemed idyllic. Modern living and technology sometimes distances those of us who are land-based from the very real truth that we are fragile creatures. The ancient people of the Near East that we read about in stories such as Noah didn't have that kind of luxury. They knew that they were fragile. They will have had a very deep awareness of their own human weakness when faced with the power of wind and wave and storm. Now, we don't really know historically whether there was one particular catastrophic flood such as described in the story, although some archeologists do believe that there was a very large disaster in the Black Sea area about 5,000 years ago, which flooded about 150,000 square kilometers of land. Others see the story as more a collection of perhaps different floods that happened, or they make comparisons with old Mesopotamian myths that also include stories of the flood. It seems likely that there was some very large event that remained in the collective memory of the survivors and was passed on 
from generation to generation. And different groups framed or understood that memory in different ways. This doesn't mean that the story of Noah, which we have in the Bible, isn't true. But the Bible contains many kinds of books and many different types of truth. Noah's life was not recorded or written down by eyewitnesses or in the lifetime of eyewitnesses in the way that the Gospels were written. The tale of the flood was much older. It was an ancient oral story that had been passed down by word of mouth and was eventually put down in writing and formed part of Hebrew scripture and then part of our Bibles. Writing things down does something, however, just as we were encouraging the kids to think about with this writing something down and giving it to somebody. It frames a story, puts it in a particular context, and in this case it illuminates a particular truth about God that is understood by its writers when we talk about what's written in scripture. Writing that's been affirmed and confirmed by generations of scholars and by individual readers and groups of readers who have interacted with the text. And that's part of what we mean by this phrase, inspired by God. It encompasses a lot of different elements. So there are many truths underlying the story of Noah. Truths such as the fact that people neglect their responsibilities to the earth and each other. That actions have consequences. That we all ignore warnings sometimes. That floods happen, spiritual ones, emotional ones, and physical ones. That human life is fragile. But the section we read today, the bit that comes after the flood, has one key truth that God is faithful. Here we have the first great promise or covenant that God offers. And it's a covenant not just with humanity, but with the whole created world, all living beings. Never again will a flood destroy all living beings, God says. One of the many irritations that I have with the fairly recent Russell Crowe film, Noah, I think it was 2014, some of you may have seen it. Something I find even more irritating than the addition of fallen angels which turn into stone golems, which you'll probably realize is nowhere in the Bible, was the fact that Crowe's Noah appears to completely forget the covenant that God has made with his family which is a covenant of survival and a promise of new life that he and his family are responsible for shepherding into being. So instead, the character in the movie decides that his family is also supposed to die out so that God can start with a clean slate, just wipe humanity off the face of the earth. Now, if the movie Noah had been as close to God as the biblical story tells us he was, one good man in a flood of evil, he would perhaps have been less likely to threaten to kill his miraculously born granddaughters, which was another movie edition. Sorry for the spoiler if you haven't seen it and are planning to watch it. It's an entertaining enough film, but not something perhaps to be watched as, a, as a, something that teaches a lot of biblical truth. But what is maybe realistic is the idea that Noah may have been tormented and burdened by his responsibility. We don't know. The Bible doesn't fill in these kind of details. Instead, it leaves us to use the gifts of our imagination, our reason, and the revelation of the Spirit in order to uncover the underlying truths. Here in this part of the story, one clear truth is given by God. I will not destroy the earth. I will not eliminate humanity. And there is some comfort in that message in a time when we look around and see so much environmental devastation and see the potential for the use of large and dangerous weapons. And God doesn't just speak the words. He leaves a visible symbol of the promise in the form of a rainbow. I've often found it moving that God's promise is represented by a rainbow. Because rainbows happen when light and rain intersect. 
And the times that we really need to lean on the promise of God are when there is rain and flood. While it's lovely to reflect on and believe in the promise of God's faithfulness when things are going well, it's a lifeline to be able to believe in that promise when things aren't going so well. In a moment, we're going to have our second reading, which is from 1 Peter. And it puts Christ's death and the promise in that in the context of the promise of the story of Noah. It's not an easy passage in some ways. So let's take a moment before we hear Linda read that and sing of that ability to trust in the Spirit to help open our hearts to God's truth. Let's sing together. Spirit of God, come dwell within me. second reading is in the New Testament and it's in the first book of Peter and we're reading at chapter 3 verses 18 to 22. For Christ died for sins once and for all, a good man on behalf of sinners, in order to lead you to God. He was put to death physically but made alive spiritually, and in his spiritual existence, he went and preached to the imprisoned spirits. These were the spirits of those who had not obeyed God when he waited patiently during the days that Noah was building his boat. The few people in the boat, eight in all, were saved by water, which was a symbol pointing to baptism, which now saves you. It is not the washing away of bodily dirt, 
but the promise made to God from a good conscience. It saves you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone to heaven and is at the right hand side of God, ruling over all angels and heavenly authorities and powers. Amen. Thanks be to God. Sometimes we make a possible mistake of thinking that in what we might call the olden days, people automatically understood everything that happened in the Bible as literal, scientific, provable fact. It's interesting, therefore, that this letter of Peter's, which was written in the first century, uses the language of myth and metaphor to explain to his first century listeners how the very real event of Christ's crucifixion and whatever else scholars debate, virtually nobody debates the fact of the crucifixion as a historical event. What that meant in the context of this ancient story of Noah. So Peter says that this ancient story of Noah, which was already ancient to the people who were reading the letter for the first time, was a symbol of baptism and a hint of the greater rescue which was to come. It tells of the washing away of sins and beginning again, not because we are righteous or clean or suddenly good, but because Christ's suffering and death has somehow covered and rescued us. And it's quite an appropriate illustration for Peter to use. And, and people who are giving sermons or, or writing this kind of pastoral letter are often looking for, for relevant illustrations to use. It's relevant in the first place because it's the, the story of a people brought through safety, through water to safety, is kind of a logical connection to baptism where we find a kind of safety through water, a spiritual safety. And it's also appropriate because it's one of the Old Testament stories that is addressed to all humanity. What we'll find as we look at some of these promises that it's, there's a certain way in which the promise starts with a general towards humanity, this covenant of God, and then it gets focused on the people of Israel. And we'll see some of these promises focused on the people of Israel. And then when Christ comes, once again, this promise has this expansion and this width that happens. And Peter's early listeners were probably um, not Jewish. They were probably Gentiles folk who weren't part of God's chosen people of Israel. So, so Peter reaches back to this story, which was addressed to all of humanity, to the descendants of Noah, which covered everybody in the, in the story. And Peter actually uses the term in the beginning of the letter of chosen people. He tells the folk listening to them, you are the chosen people. And in this section, he calls it on this promise that's been made to the descendants of Noah. But Peter does something else. He also talks about our promise. He speaks of the promise or pledge of good conscience. And the word that's used in Greek is a word that was used in legal agreements. So somebody would, would propose something, would offer something, and you would respond, you would agree with your pledge of good conscience. So the promise of God was more than a promise. It was a covenant. It was something that has a question and an answer. An offer and an acceptance is what made it binding. And that's why our baptismal liturgies, and we've got two baptisms coming up, two in a row, so both next week and the week after, we are going to be, be welcoming two babies and families into our midst, which is lovely. And, and you'll notice, you'll have the opportunity to be reminded once again that baptism involves questions and answers. In this case, the, the parents answer on behalf of their commitment to the child. And what it points to is the fact that we have to agree to God's promise if it's going to be truly binding. And by that I mean if it's going to be really effective in our lives. God is faithful, but we also need to agree to accept that. 
and that brings some responsibilities. So as we start Lent and we celebrate the first Sunday of Lent and we begin this journey to the cross once again, the question that I'd like to challenge us all to live with over this next week is, what is our response to God's faithfulness? How do we say yes? Perhaps, like the biblical Noah, saying yes is a willingness to do what is necessary, what is asked for us in times of wind and storm. And I know that many people here in this church responded that way in terms of the physical wind and storm when there was that flooding that we referred to, that I referred to earlier, supporting those who've been flooded out of their houses. And I know so many here are so generous when it comes to the emergency appeals that we get, whether that's for help locally or internationally. Again and again, people are very generous in their responses. But it's still sometimes a challenge to be generous and faithful in a time of crisis, especially when we doubt our own fellow human beings. I feel deeply this week for all the many dedicated charity workers everywhere who must be worried about how they're going to be able to sustain and have their work supported in the wake of the, the various public scandals right now and investigations to do with Oxfam and other charities. And it's absolutely right that any misconduct does need to be investigated and addressed. And it's perfectly reasonable for people to question when you are giving money, where it is going and how it's being used and who is using it. But we cannot stop being generous just because the charity sector is going through something of a storm at the moment. In many ways, our generosity is even more important. Too many people will suffer if we are not faithful in responding to God's faithfulness with generosity, especially in times of crisis. And what about our response to God's promise of faithfulness on a more personal level? And here I'm talking less about crises, less about those times of storm in our own lives, and more about how we handle the, the eddies and the flows of daily life. Maybe saying yes in this context means consciously looking for signs of the rainbow. Not with a naive or force-fed cheerfulness, and certainly not by denying the reality of pain, but with a willingness to look for the refraction of holy light in the bittersweet mix of love and struggle that is so often part of our experience of life. God makes the promise, but it's up to us to accept that promise if we want to see and be aware of God's faithfulness in our lives. Lives that are full of ups and downs, full of light and of rain. Accepting God's promise of faithfulness doesn't mean never having any doubts. And it doesn't mean accepting everything that happens to us without protest. There is a long history of struggling with doubt and protest in the Bible. Nor does it mean going around and battering everyone over the head with an ironclad conviction that all must be well in every possible circumstances. I don't know about you, but sometimes if you're at the receiving end of that kind of forced enthusiasm, it can be a bit like having a torch shone directly in your eyes, blinding rather than encouraging. It's lovely for people to be confident and sure in their faith, but we should always aim for that to be something that encourages people, not batters them down further. Saying yes to God's promise of faithfulness also means being willing to seek God's blessing at the beginning of every new endeavor, every new season in our lives, every new venture. It means having our eyes open for the sighting of a rainbow. It means understanding through long experience that sometimes a fish will rise unexpectedly from a deep hidden pool. I've been invited back by the local anglers next year to bless the waters again. Hopefully not dependent on the results of this year's season. 
Who knows, maybe I'll even invest in a pair of waders and have a go at fishing myself. Mike Pickford tells me there's no such thing as a pair of fashionable waders, but maybe they just require the right accessories. In any case, I do hope the Dawn and the Yuri are kind to us this year, staying safely within their banks and producing an abundance of life. But whether the waters be kind or not, whether there is calm or storm, God promises us that he will be faithful, that there is a width and a depth and a flow to his mercy that is beyond all judgment, that we all rest within his hands, hands that hold the world. It is up to us to live out the truth of that promise, to work for the common good in the name of Christ, who died that we might live and flourish and be a blessing to all creation. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, responding to that call to be faithful to God with a song that the words seemed particularly appropriate to me. It's not one I'm sure we have sung before, but Alison thought the tune might be familiar. It's called God of Freedom, God of Justice. Alison, could you play it all the way through for us once so that we get it in our heads before we sing? <laughs> That was a little bit more difficult than I anticipated. Would the singers be willing to sing us a verse of it? Maybe the last verse, just so that we can all hear it and appreciate the words for the moment? Because sometimes when you're struggling to follow a tune, it's difficult to kind of appreciate the words. So if you folks wouldn't mind just singing for us, maybe the last verse through, and we can just, uh, um, from making us a captive conscience, and we can just all listen to that. Thank you.
Sometimes it's nice to take the moment just to appreciate the words and the sound without the, the burden of trying to work your way through it. Let us pray. God of freedom and justice, we know the world is still not the way you designed it to be. Selfishness, greed and fear still exist in the human heart and we see the evil that this creates every day. How many of our actions are like nails in the cross? How often must Jesus' cries of pain and protest be heard before we change? Yet through it all, you are faithful. So we true tr too try to be faithful in prayer and in action. Lord, we ask that your blessings flow into the places most in need of you today. We think of the families of the young people of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida, and those of the other young people who have suffered through recent school shootings in America. We stand in solidarity with an increasing number of young Americans and not so young who are demanding that a solution be found to US gun violence. Lord, sometimes righteous anger is a blessing, especially when channeled with wisdom and care. And yet anger on its own solves nothing. And so we ask for wise and principled leaders to arise in the US and the UK, in Russia and in Europe, in the Congo, in Yemen and Venezuela, in countries at war and countries at peace. Men and women who listen and obey like Noah. Women and men who give of themselves like Jesus. All united in the desire to look after the gift of your creation and its creatures. Lord, we pray also for your blessing on the many and many who have lived faithful lives, but for whom things are difficult right now. Illness and pain and fear can weary even the strongest of us, but you do not require us to be strong. It is sometimes in the fractured glass of our weakness that your light is most clearly seen. We thank you that there can be beauty in brokenness and that it is possible to find peace at the heart of the storm. Yet we also trust that you long for us and our world to be whole. And so we lay claim to your promise of a soul and a world washed clean and made new, even if we cannot see it yet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our offerings will now be brought forward and dedicated. Let us pray. Lord, bless these offerings which are part of our attempts to say yes to your promise of faithfulness. Out of what we have been given, we dedicate this portion of our money, our time and our talents to be used with wisdom and care. We are ready and willing to be surprised by what you might do when we promise to give you our best. In Jesus' name, Amen. A few uh, notes to draw your attention to on the orders of service. Um, we have uh, the Lent Reflections continuing in the afternoon on Wednesday afternoons. There'll also be a few evening ones. We have one evening one this week at the Mance if anyone wants to, to come along at 7.30 on Wednesday and then there'll be another one a fortnight later. The, there's a particular plea for duty officers for the Acorn Centre. We have wonderful team of volunteers at the Acorn Centre, um, but it's particularly challenging sometimes to find folk willing to be duty officers. So if you feel at all you might be willing to help out with this, then please speak to one of the Acorn management team and they can let you know what's involved. And there is full training. We're also, we've been talking about our anniversary celebrations coming up. And one of the things we're doing is compiling a kind of archive of um, photos and, and things and having an exhibition. So if you do happen to have any old photos, either of the old building or, or the old um, design or during the process that you think might be of interest to the team, then please speak to Alan Harrow or Mark Patterson and they can scan the photos and return them to you. Or you might have some other artifacts that you think are of interest, that would be, um, that would be great. 
Um, a note that's not in the order of service but will be next week is that um, we have a, a new group starting in the church they're calling um, uh, themselves Amity and it's a friendship and fellowship group which is designed for folk who are of working age basically and they will be um, doing different activities together and, and um, exploring different interests depending on what the group enjoys. So their first meeting is going to be a week on uh, Tuesday around the uh, family table in the Acorn Centre. So Fran or Linda are the two to speak to if you are interested in finding out more about that group. Uh, and finally, a reminder that we have our soup and sweet lunch instead of our usual hospitality after the, the service today, and that is to help the junior church in their uh, fundraising efforts for the Pitscurry project. I'm sure it is going to be wonderful. And if you are watching online and, uh, um, or live, I am sorry that you're going to miss out on it. And I do hope you enjoy whatever you're having for your lunch or perhaps for Anne-Marie watching from New Zealand, your midnight snack. Um, but do, do enjoy it and think of us as you, as you share whatever meal you are sharing next. So we'll finish today by singing a song of promise, and it's about our promise as well as the promise of Christ. So let's sing together, O oh Jesus, I have promised. Now let us go, confident that we do indeed have the grace to follow Christ and to live his promise. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, 
and Holy Spirit be with us all. Thank you.